Hey, snackers. On the next episode of DevNet Snack Minute, join Cisco's own Julio Gomez as he talks about his journey of becoming a net DevOps engineer. Hey everyone, uh, Matt Napoli here. I'm one of the managers of developer advocacy with the Cisco DevNet program. Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem Iskander. I'm a developer advocate with Cisco DevNet. Uh, welcome to episode 19 of DevNet Snack Minutes. DevNet Snack Minute is your weekly 10 minute all things DevNet, giving you a quick, fun way to learn about Cisco APIs, coding, and just some cool stuff that we do here. And the person we're going to be talking to today is one of the coolest, smartest uh, network engineers, net DevOps engineers, uh, programmers, whatever you want to call it. He covers such a wide swath, um, and we're excited to have him today. But I'm going to let him introduce himself to us. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Matt. So my name is Julio Gomez, and these days I'm lucky enough to be running programmability across EMER sales. In the current role, I'm lucky enough to think on how I can help my community and how I can support their programmability related activities. Good to have you on the show, uh, Julio. And uh, I'm, I'm a bit jealous of that introduction because I never get that from Matt. But um, tell us a little bit about your career as a network engineer and how you got there and you know what, what, what made you get into it. Great question, Karim. So um, I joined Cisco in year 2000. Um, and I decided that I wanted to join Cisco because it was already the standard in terms of networking. I was already in love with networking and I wanted to find my way around this coolest technology, the coolest technology ever. Um, networking, routing protocols, OSPF, BGP, you know, everything. I, I was in love with everything related to networking. So joining Cisco was kind of a dream come true for me. And in those 20 years, since year 2000, I have been um, running many different roles around networking as a network engineer, as a systems engineer, as a field engineer, technical consultant, everything related to um, technical staff related to networking. So that's been my role for the last 20 years. And now these days, I have just uh, started doing something else that is a little bit different that I'd like to discuss with you. So you mentioned, uh running programmability out of out of Europe or Amir, uh, for those of you who don't know our acronyms. Um, can you expand on what that means and the community you engage with and, and how you kind of visualize your job? Yeah, in my current job, um, I'm nurturing, I would say, a community of 700 plus individuals that are as passionate as us on programmability. They are really in love with what they do. And they want to make sure that they can leverage what their peers are doing, but also to share what they have accomplished. And the community, the power of the community is about you give one and you receive 100. And that's really, really powerful. The kind of uh, common knowledge that we have in the communities of today is huge. So it's my remit, and I'm very, very lucky to nurture this community and make sure that they learn and share as much as possible in all things programmability. And that's innovation, automation, integration, everything that is API driven. Julio, I, and I know uh, this would resonate with um, a lot of our audience and, um, you know, starting your career as a network engineer and kind of morphing it into a net DevOps or devops -y kind of role um, is something that a lot of a lot of our DevNet community, a lot of us actually, you know, had to get that mind shift. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that journey and what took you from, you know, how did you do it? How did you get from a network engineer all the way to kind of like leveraging those skill sets and applying them in a net devops -y kind of culture? Absolutely. You know, when I joined Cisco in year 2000, I started doing the usual stuff that all networking engineers did at that time, which was about, you know, QS and ACLs, spanning tree, you know, the classic stuff, you know, and you learn all the basics there, routing protocols and everything. And when I take a look at my career five years later, maybe by, by the year, you know, 2005, I was doing the evolution of those technologies. You know, I was doing MPLS and then multi-protocol VGP to implement layer two and layer three VPNs, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and if I look 10 years, you know, going to the, the uh, year 2010, I was doing the evolution of that. I was doing IPv6 and I was doing managed services and CP, you know, all that kind of stuff, firewalling. You know, if I think about it, it's always been an evolution, you know, going into VXLAN, going into SDN, that's always been an evolution. But in the last three years, 
three, four years, I've noticed that the skill set required for our next generation SE has changed. And the skills that I'm using today are very, very different. You know, I find myself doing a lot of Python. I find myself using a lot of REST and RESTConf and NetConf and using young data models. You know, I'm, I'm basically doing very different stuff that I do not consider the evolution of what I was doing previously, but rather a radically different new set of skills. And those skills, you need to acquire them with a conscious effort. You know, it's not something that will come natural. The closest that I was to that was when I, you know, when I was writing TCL scripts or EEM, Embedded Event Manager scripts. But other than that, you know, you really, really need to make a conscious effort to start studying new things, new technologies that are key if you want to jump into this new profile of what we call the next generation as maker. In order to do that, I had to learn a lot of this by myself. I got inspired by others that had already started this path, and I aspire myself to serve as inspiration for, for how you can do this yourself. That's awesome. Um, you know, we we actually try. I try to emulate uh, that in in how I approach, um, you know, teaching others and trying to get everyone up to speed because that's what we're trying to do at DevNet. Uh, but you know, from your experience, you know, my I observe you going through this process on your own and kind of being self driven. Um, but for people that kind of are coming up to speed with that, can you tell us some of the like key learnings that you? had gone through some of the big lessons when you're going through that process, because I think that that could really help out our community as they're, they're moving forward with these topics. You know, I, I will tell you my biggest weakness is I have really bad memory, but that has okay. played very well for me because as long as I don't remember anything that I did last week, I have to document everything. You know, I really have to document everything that I do so that I can remember later. So what I did in this whole process, since I started, I documented my whole path with all the code that I've been using, why I wanted to use that, how I learned about this, what kind of resources, where you can find the required resources that you can use to emulate or replicate what I did. And you know, initially I did it for myself. It was kind of a love letter to my future self. You know, like, don't worry, you know, I got you covered. <laughs> but then later on, I decided that I wanted to give back to the amazing community of systems engineers that are out there helping others. And I documented everything in a couple of GitHub repos, where you can find basically everything that you need to get started from scratch on all things DevOps and Net DevOps. And those documents are kind of long books. You know, they, they, they might be the kind of books that you find at Cisco Press. Um, and, and they are really, really uh, focused on a hands on approach. I'm very pragmatic. Um, you know, when, I, when you go into a session and they tell you about the cultural change that DevOps implies and everything, that's like, OK, but I'm an engineer. Show me the, the tool set. So right. this, this, these documents are focused on that, on, on really giving you the pragmatical approach, on showing you what is the real tool set that you need to learn and how you can use it to address real customer challenges. And for me, that's what I would have liked to have when I was on the other side of the fence, when I was just learning, I would have loved to have something like this. So that's why I wrote it, and that's why I'm sharing it with the community. I will take a moment to actually plug uh, Julio's uh, blog series. Um, it has actually been super useful to members of our team. I've used it uh, as a reference point for building out some demos and some and talks as well. Uh, so thank you for writing that love letter to yourself because it really became a love letter to me as well <laughs> and a number of people in our community. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. You know, I'm sure in your journey, you'll leverage what DevNet has to offer, right? And uh, just give us an idea of, you know, how did, how did DevNet help you? And, you know, where did you find yourself playing in when you, when you came to developer.cisco.com? DevNet has been the key enabler for everything that I've done in these last years, up to the point that without definite resources, it would have been completely impossible for me to learn anything that I've done on this. Because if you think about it, if you wanna learn about any technology, usually you need resources. And the kind of resources that you need might be in the cloud, might be on-premises, 
but you always need to find them and you need to make them available to you. Um, you know, the place where I live, I don't think that my family would be happy with having uh, uh, here in the room a rack of servers that I could use for whatever I wanted to do or spending a lot of money on cloud bills, you know, because of the services that I'm using on the cloud. <laughs> so DevNet was uh, the key enabler because not only I got access to learning labs, to DevNet Express events, but also to sandboxes and environments that I could use to really test and prototype everything in the way, in the path that I was following to learn on all things programmability. So everything that I did was enabled by definite resources. And I would encourage everyone out there to take a look at everything that is available because it's for free. Let me say it again, it's for free. Leverage it, don't miss this amazing opportunity provided by DevNet. Well, thank you, Julio, for calling out DevNet on that. I know we kind of prompted you. That's cool anyway. Um, that is, we're kind of uh, coming to the end of our time on this, but we do ask all of our guests um, one very specific question, and that is, if you could pick any superpower, what would that be and why? You know, I, I always enjoy um, meeting people and try to convey a message. If I could have a superpower, it would be the power to inspire others to accomplish whatever they want to do, to enable them as much as possible the skills that they need to accomplish their own goals. So if I could choose a superpower, it would be the power to inspire others and to make sure that they feel confident enough in the fact that they can accomplish whatever they want. Well, I think you might already have that superpower. <laughs> Thank you, Julio. That was, that was great. Uh, I'm actually inspired by your superpower. Um, and thank you, Snackers, for joining us on this episode of Snack Minute, and see you next time.